welcome to the Internet Foundation and Stockholm, Carl. Bjorn, hello. How are you? I'm, yeah, very good, thank you. A little cold, but then as a Brit in Sweden, that's probably to be expected, isn't it? Yeah, and you can you can hear the difference between your English and my English. <laughs> you can I said that, can't hear my Swedish. I said that the it. audience uh, now have to listen to my, to my school English. <laughs> Before you start, what does CASM stand for? Right, yes. So CASM stands for the Center for the Analysis of Social Media. So I am a, I'm an internet researcher, basically. Yeah. So great. Uh, if you just take one step further me and you go. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, firstly, Bjorn, everyone, thanks so much for having me. And thanks to you all as well for tuning in. Um, my story begins um, in around 2004, 2005, when I think something unbelievably important started to happen. If we go back then, I think militaries all over the world were asking themselves the same kind of questions. We're going into the information age, they were reasoning with themselves. Information is increasingly centric, it's increasingly important to society. How do we, as militaries, actually react to all of that? And I think kind of once after the other, again and again, kind of militaries began to rewrite uh, their op operational doctrines. We did it in the UK, the Russians did it in Russia. It didn't really matter whether you're a liberal democratic or an autocratic country. I think, I think militaries kind of all answered maybe this almost identity crisis in the same way. I think maybe they felt like they were somehow dropping behind these kind of big, kind of clunking hierarchies of steel and, and explosives in an age that increasingly felt like information was it, at its very heart. Um, and I think the answer that they each had to this question was to conduct a extremely important kind of reconceptualization of information. Now, information had always been, has always been seen as a tool of war. So you go back to inflatable tanks during Normandy, or you go back even earlier to the Crusades and fake letters being written to try and get people to leave besieged towns. Information has always been used by militaries. It's always been a tool. But in 2005, 2006, as these doctrines began to be rewritten, as this thinking was increasingly happening, I think a fateful pivot happened. Rather than seeing information as a tool of war, I think people increasingly began to see information as a theatre of war. So a place, in a weird way, that warfare actually happened within. And then this new kind of warfare, information warfare, kind of began to emerge. It was, you know, it was one that was interested in memetics. It was one that was interested in cognitive psychology. It was interested in, in how attention is spent. It was interested in how ideas are spread. It was interested in lots of things. Uh, but primarily, it was, it was the beginning of a series of problem solvings that militaries began around, hey, if information is a theater of war, how do we fight in it? How do we act within it? How do we maneuver within it? And so a kind of strange kind of warfare began to emerge. It was a strange kind of warfare for sure. It was one that was likely to package information or messages in cats to make them spread more readily and more quickly around the internet. Uh, it was one that might see sock puppets, fake accounts, dispersed across digital spaces, uh, almost like you would um, disperse assets across a physical space. It was one that might see attention as a form of territory. It was, it was a strange kind of warfare, but it was a kind of warfare nonetheless. Now, I think that was a very important moment uh, that brought all of us to a kind of strange new sort of front line. And to show you what that front line looks like, to try and make clear what that really means for you and for me and for everyone the living in societies where, where, which are somewhat subject and sometimes targeted of information warfare, well, the way to do that, I actually need to bring you into an information warfare campaign. So come with me and we're going to soar in and actually look at what one of these campaigns really looks like. What does this conflict in information space really look like? So it was the, it was the early days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and I was there, like many people, looking at social media, trying to follow what was happening. And my social media feeds were absolutely full, wall to wall, with revulsion at the invasion and support for Ukraine. And then it was totally astonishing, it was totally stunning, 
uh, I saw uh, in early March um, hash two hashtags begin to trend across social media platforms around the world, including in the UK. I stand with Putin and hashtag I stand with Russia. And um, it, was, it was completely at odds with my understanding of what social media was actually doing at that point. And so I, I with colleagues at Chasm, we began to dug in, dig into this to understand what was really going on. It was a few days, actually, just before the UN General Assembly vote uh, to, uh, to condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, everyone always worries about the use of AI in information warfare, in disinformation, in fooling all of us. Uh, but AI is also actually extremely useful, indeed, I would say invaluable, in actually allowing us to make sense of all of that, to actually spot information warfare when it's currently happening. And that's what we did here. So we took the 10,000 accounts on Twitter that were pumping out those two hashtags, I stand with Putin and I stand with Russia. 10,000 accounts. And then we used very, very clever maths that my, that my colleagues develop, uh, uh, natural language processing, algorithms. And what we essentially did was to turn language, I know this is going to sound strange, to turn language into space. So we could map out these 10,000 accounts by the language that they use. So if accounts were using very similar language, very similar words and tropes, uh, very similar phrases and ideas, then they will be close to each other on this map. And if they didn't, then they'd be quite far away. So we took those 10,000 accounts, we did all that math using the language, and then we put it onto a map. And this is what we saw. We could see that there were very specific kind of clusters of accounts on this map that all seem to be using language really similarly to each other. You can see there, there's a kind of tight knot of red accounts there at the bottom. There's another tight knot of blue accounts over on the side. There's a somewhat less dense kind of spread of purple and yellow accounts at the top. And it turned out that this campaign, this kind of incident or case study of information warfare is an unbelievably good kind of example of what I think are a series of far more general trends around information warfare, far more general ways, things of how it actually works. And lesson number one that this taught us is that information warfare begins not with disinformation itself, but with identity. So when we actually dived into this map to actually characterize it, to work out what on earth it was, the first thing we realized is that each of these different classes of accounts were different identities. There was, a, uh, there was a Hindi using uh, a, a knot of, uh, of Indian accounts there in the red. Uh, there were South Africans there in the yellow. There were tunnels of Indian accounts and South Asian accounts linking them up. Uh, there were extrusions of Tamil language accounts going off one side, extrusions of Pakistan and Iranian accounts coming off the other. But crucially, none of these accounts were either claiming to be nor addressing the West. These were all accounts that were claiming to be, at least claiming to be, from elsewhere in the world. Lesson number two, information warfare, an enormous amount of part of it is actually to do with attention. We live in, ex we live, all of us, in worlds where our attention is being clawed at and being competed for kind of by all these different actors all the time. And a huge part of information warfare is actually simply getting your attention in the first place. And that's what a lot of this campaign was actually trying to do. So those three, uh, those, those, uh, those clusters that I've ringed there, the point of them, the red, the green, the blue, the gray, they were pumping out retweets. Their job was to get hashtag I stand with Putin, hashtag I stand with Russia trending. It, this was actually an attack on the trending box, I would say, of Twitter. But the, the point of all of this was to fire retweets at a very small number of pro-invasion viral messages. That's what we began to learn uh, that this campaign was all about. And as we began to learn that, it becomes clear that getting it into that trending box was the way in which they were trying to capture people's attention. A huge amount of information warfare, again and again, we always see is to do with attention and how it can be won and how it can be held, and only then how it can be used and exploited. Lesson number three, confirmation. What this campaign was really doing, and I think what information warfare does so often, is rather than actually, and I, I think disinformation is actually quite a poor description of what information warfare really is. Rather than lying to you to get you to change your mind, 
again and again, when we pull these campaigns apart, what we actually see that they're doing is they're telling you things you already think are true about the world. They're confirming your worldview. They're substantiating the beliefs that you already hold. And they often try to use that to take you in a particular direction. And so we saw with this campaign, these are some of the very, very highly shared messages it was sending. They were addressing their audiences uh, with messages that they thought already resonated, that already struck home, that were already widely believed. So there were messages there which were uh, already, uh, which were trying to connect to uh, anti-colonial sentiments. There were messages there that were already trying to connect to kind of simmering grievances to do with um, a series of uh, NATO interventions around the world, essentially trying to characterize the Russian intervention as no worse, no different from all these other things that NATO has done on their side. Uh, there were also just messaging in there that was trying to connect, uh, that was trying to address like kind of pro-Russian kind of representations of strengths, especially mimetic representation of strengths. But then, kind of mixed in with all of this is often a tangle of authentic and inauthentic at the same time. There's often like such a strange and difficult combination of both some people in these digital worlds that um, have nothing to do with information warfare. They just genuinely support the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They genuinely support the messages around anti-colonialism, that they have deep-seated views which already lean them in a certain direction. But in and amongst them, we see inauthenticness. We see people trying to game these platforms. We see fake accounts, fictitious identities. We p see people trying to construct falsehoods at quite large scales, often using um, the ways in which these platforms work in order to try and exploit them. And to understand that here, let's dive into the blue cluster. So in the blue cluster, you can see a tight knot of accounts, all using language very similar. This is what they look like. They have barely any profile photos. And you can see there in that graph, that's when they started tweeting. So they almost like activated on the day of the invasion itself. They often went from this kind of dormant state to suddenly start messaging. And then that climbed and climbed and climbed until the day of the actual UN vote, they are at their peak. And after the day of the UN vote, they actually start to decline again. They start to become less active. They were all very young accounts. And then if we dive in even closer, we can see when they were set up. A huge spike of these accounts set up on the day of the invasion, another huge spike set up on the day of the UN vote. So whilst there are genuine voices and real people in and amongst these accounts on social media, there also are these accounts. These accounts are not real. They're very likely not set up by genuine people. They're very likely part of an orchestrated and coordinated campaign. And we know that because the BBC did a follow-up of this work and actually tracked down some of the self-same people whose profiles were being used by these accounts. And they weren't real. Uh, and they didn't know that their profile pictures were being used. So information warfare is often this kind of tangle of authenticity and inauthenticity all wrapped up as one. Now, that was one campaign one campaign that happened in 2022. But since then, we've seen information warfare obviously not just being conducted by militaries, being conducted by all different kinds of group. I mean, information warfare, you might say, is much more of a mindset. It's a much more of a way of approaching information than it is actually um, a, a description of the people that actually do it. But, we, but also that the front lines have come to Sweden. So we've been working with the Swedish Institute at Chasm Tech, uh, using the actually very same methods that we used all the way back in 2022, but looking at all the different discussions that are being had about Sweden. Three million messages in total, seven languages, lots of different platforms. Now, lots of those are all kinds of normal, conventional, mainstream discussions about Sweden. Uh, but there are about 100,000 of those messages um, and th there, there, there they all are. Those are all the different topics about Sweden. Far too many for me to jump into, I'm afraid, uh, and talk about now. Uh, but of all these millions and millions of messages, about 100,000 were on incendiary, very divisive uh, topics, many of the topics we're discussing today. Uh, and, uh, and here's a map of those. And of the map of these incendiary topics, there is one that I wanted to foreground, and that is the discussion around Swedish social services. Now, here with Swedish Social Services, if we dive in, we can see that it's actually comprised of two different discussions together. You've got a series of discussions um, around not specific complaints of specific cases, 
but narratives and messages and stories seeking to portray Swedish social services as being engaged in a secret and subterranean plot to systematically remove children from Muslim homes. And that's connected with calls to emigration. And I think that, to me, is one of the most significant things about this campaign and, one of those, and, and, and probably my, my parting thought when it comes to information warfare. If there is one thing that the people that do information warfare do not care about, it is the information itself. What they care about are the effects that it has. Information warfare, like any sorts of warfare, are basically interested in effects, are in behavioural and attitudinal effects. And I think what we see here with the, the campaigns regarding Sweden is that beginning to happen. So not just discussions around Swedish social services, but then also it being connected with calls to emigrate around, out of Sweden or to avoid Sweden altogether. Now, the polling is beginning to suggest that this might be having a strategic effect, uh, not necessarily changing people's mind about Sweden, but entrenching the views of some, maybe already distrustful of social services, uh, and, and hardening it and connecting it with a call to action. So we're all in a strange way now, I think, on a new front line. Uh, we're all having to deal with the fact that information is a theatre of war, whether we like it or not. Um, and I think we all, in Sweden, in the UK, around the world, but certainly those of us in the liberal democracies with in open information ecologies, we have to deal with this mindset, we have to deal with this tradecraft, uh, and we have to begin to build all different layers of defences to make this more difficult. Now, of course, we need to make more resilient populations, of course, we need to raise awareness this is actually happening. But we also need to make the information spaces themselves less open, less gameable, less vulnerable. And then ultimately, I think we also have to make the actual conducting of information warfare less profitable and less easy to do. Like, and that, I think, is probably, of all the things, the, kind of the most important challenge for us uh, uh, in the months ahead. Because we're living through a year of elections, billions of people voting. And what can be done to change strategic opinions about a country uh, can also be done around elections. So we have a real tangle of unbelievably important kind of challenges ahead of us. Uh, and uh, if there's one thing that doesn't cross board, uh, doesn't respect borders, information warfare, and therefore neither can our responses. Thank you very much. And thank you, Carl. Do you sell those uh, diagrams and maps as artwork? I should get them it's printed. They're beautiful. Got a, got a poster. <laughs> yeah, interesting <laughs> and beautiful. Um, I heard that you dislike the term disinformation, but I'm going to stick to that. I hope that's okay. And I listened to you in a podcast called Your Undivided Attention, and you talked about the difficulties of countering disinformation with counterfacts. Mm. The reason being that disinformation is not pure lies, but real life events confirming what we really believe in. And you also talk about people seeking rela relationships and th that the greatest vulnerability to disinformation is loneliness. Could you please elaborate on that? And also what, what in your opinion, I know you, you finished with that, but what, what in your opinion is the best way to counter disinformation? Well. If, if you take nothing away from my talk, <laughs> yeah. take away this. Yeah. Disinformation is a horrible way of explaining this because what it does is it sets up the idea that what is really at stake here are, are truth and lies. And that how we're being attacked is that lies are being propagated online. Now, information warfare doesn't care about whether it's true or whether it's a lie. What it cares about is the effects the information can have. You can build an extremely distorted picture of the world simply by selecting some truths rather than others. Um, and that's why I think, like, kind of simply, you know, tr tr trying to uh, identify solutions as being simply confronting the lies, that doesn't work. Like, what is happening is that there are orchestrated, coordinated, professional campaigns that exist trying to manipulate information spaces to have effects. Yeah. That is the problem. And like, until we wake up and like, kind of understand that you know, um, it's really the sort, these campaigns are the source of so many of the online harms that we're trying to deal with, I don't think we're going to grow a series of solutions to suit. And how should we wake up? How, how should we get conscious about this is, that this is happening? We need, to, we need to make these campaigns costlier, riskier, more chaotic, and less easy to do. 
Like there are companies openly vending online manipulation services. It's not illegal to do. Yeah. You know that trade in 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 the economy. You know, and in and in Western economies around the world. I think this is absolutely mad that companies are allowed to do that sort of thing. Like likewise, I think we should be looking at sanctions, no fly lists. We should be looking at all the things that we've we've used in elsewhere. Uh, you know, uh, to defend against other kinds of external threats and begin to apply them into information spaces as well. Because at the moment, not only is this something which is being conducted, I think, on behalf of states, it's also become a business. Yeah. You know, and whilst it makes money, of course, people are going to do it. So we have to try and drain away all of that profit incentive yeah. uh, and make it riskier. And how do we do that? Well, we need to start changing law. We need to start regulating. Uh, and of course, like the platforms, you know, have a part to play in this as well. Yeah. I have a question on when when you're speaking about regulation and, and platforms. The Digital Services Act introduces a number of obligations to tackle the spread of disinformation. Uh, and this includes uh, risk management, risk mitigation and a mechanism, a, a crisis mechanism when the platform is used for the wide spread of disinformation. What do you think about uh, about this ambition from the Digital Services Act to to help help with this? Mm. The Digital Services Act is game changing. Thank you very much, European Union. It's the, one of the, it's the most important piece of legislation in this area in the world that's ever been passed. Um, disinformation, as I've just said, I don't think it's the right way of describing this. So I think responsibilities have to kind of lean more towards identifying and mitigating these campaigns, like whether they're spreading truth or lies or anything else, they shouldn't be present. You know, an autocratic intelligence agency shouldn't be manipulating information in any way, even if it's spread truths during an election. But I think it's I th I think it's going to change an enormous amount and I think it's going to improve an enormous amount. The crux is how quickly this can happen. So we have an enormous number of elections this year. Like our our societies are vulnerable to this right now. Like we do not have several years to roll out you know, the regulatory and the legal kind of like framework and mechanisms. This needs to happen just about as quickly as it possibly can. Yeah. You, you mentioned the, the, the so-called super election year coming up. What, what do you see ahead of the EU elections uh, in specific and how, how should we prepare for it in Sweden? So I think like right now, uh, the, 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 my greatest fear is, the, is that there's going to be a series of campaigns to try and legitimize, delegitimize the outcome. So I often think it doesn't necessarily, you know, I mean, of course, conspiracy theories will be amplified. Of course, extremist groups will be amplified and supported if they can by various kinds of malign actors. But I think the greatest worry is this kind of attempt to try and erode the very basic sense that Swedes have that the election was fairly fought uh, and fairly won, whoever wins it. And that, you know, uh, the democratic institutions of Sweden can be trusted. I think that's what we have to begin to prepare for. Um, at the very least, of course, we need to start equipping people with some basic rules around how they can go out during this election. I wouldn't turn to digital spaces at all to make really, really important decisions about where to vote and how to vote. Um, I also, if there's one rule I think that people can live by, um, guard against your own outrage. Know that it's when you're nodding your head, that's when you're most likely to be being manipulated. It's not when you're being confronted by something you think is a lie. Thank you so much, Carl. I would have, <laughs> I wanted to continue this conversation because <laughs> it's yeah. so interesting. But I know you're off to Oslo, so I wish yeah. you a safe trip. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.